Will lockdowns end with Biden's reopen plan? D.C. braces for Inauguration Day and Trump to declassify some Russia collusion documents. Finally, it seems the obvious is something that the libs, the Democrats will say out loud when it comes to lockdown. Only a few of them, mind you. It, it's just beginning to happen. But for the first time, you're starting to see articles. You're seeing discussion from politicians like the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, the mayor of Chicago, America's third largest city, Lori Lightfoot. And now a Newsweek piece, COVID lockdowns have no clear benefit versus other voluntary measures international study shows. So that's something that I've been saying for a long time. But now we can actually talk about it. This is interesting. There is a coincidental timing, it seems. Now, there's also the timing one would expect. The vaccines were approved in December, and now we're getting into middle of January, and things were... were halfway into the winter here. So obviously, I, I get it. There would be a more, a more of a light at the end of the tunnel feel. But just yesterday, you had Joe Biden telling everybody about his $1.8 trillion reopen plan to save America. And now you're also seeing the beginnings, the, the, first, uh, the first few conversations happening publicly about maybe these lockdowns weren't such a good idea. Oh, really? Just before Inauguration Day, right, right, right when we're about to see a change in government, there's the, 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 the seeds of sanity being planted. I'm very pleased about that. It makes me happy. Um, it should have happened a long time ago. And I also, I can't help but take something of, of a cynical view about all this because, for example, the Joe Biden rescue plan that's been talked about here, $1.8 trillion. Uh, how do you oppose that when what you're going to be opposing is the rescue of America from COVID? How can you say there's too much spending going on when a lot of that spending will be money that should have been spent months and months ago, but Nancy Pelosi thwarted it and the Democrats stopped it? How do you, how do you deal with all that? What do you do? Uh, what political opposition will Republicans really be able to put up? I think the answer is not a whole lot. Oh, we're going to start the usual we're spending too much money conversation. Is that where it's going to go? Fine. We can do that. And it's true. It's not that that's not accurate, but we didn't talk about that for four years. Occasionally, I used to say on this show, I know nobody wants to hear about it, but we're spending too much money as a government. Right? The Treasury was profligate in its spending. And when the good times were happening, and they were until COVID for three years of Trump's presidency, nobody wanted to hear about it. It was just something that was happening in the background. Be quiet, MAGA, look at the stock market. That was the attitude. Now, I understand how that happened, but we now also have to face the reality of Democrats coming in with united control of the government and being able to say not only did, did Republicans not curb their spending, but they have this added mission of saving America from COVID, which is going to require a ton of spending. And just like, I, can you see the parallels with 2008? Just like when Obama came into office in 2009, he won the 2008 election, and it was a trillion dollar stimulus package. Remember that? And that sounded like a lot of money, didn't it? It is a lot of money. We're looking at $1.8 trillion right now. Basically double. And that's after spending trillions in the, last, in the last 12 months, in addition to the enormous federal outlay that was planned before COVID. So Biden is also being set up here to be the savior, in a sense, right? He is the cure. You can almost write the headlines right now. And he's going to be able to get away with the Democrat. But it's not even Biden. He's just the figurehead. The Democrat machinery around him is going to be ramming through whatever they want, all under this aegis of COVID. That's what they'll do. All under this COVID situation. And if you oppose it, they'll say that you don't want America to, to be better off and, and you don't want Americans to be, 
taken care of during this terrible and difficult time. So what does that leave us with? Uh, That leaves us with a very challenging case to make here. We're going to have Republicans who have no actual political authority and who are on the precipice of getting steamrolled on the filibuster, which I think is also going to happen. You see, that that, that then becomes the, the tripwire. Biden has this $1.8 trillion, and, and you're looking through all this stuff, you know, $15 minimum wage. It's got all these things in it, right? $15 minimum wage, $2,000 payments to individuals. You know that there's going to be a whole lot of other stuff in there. There is a whole lot of other stuff in there. That has nothing to do with saving America from COVID, but it's, it's money that Democrats, it's your money that Democrats want to spend on favored constituencies. But just like with the financial crisis in 2009, right, a crisis is a, is a terrible thing to waste. They are already setting this up. It's a replay. To borrow from Yogi Berra, it is deja vu all over again. We're seeing right now the Democrats really it's almost like doing Obama administration 2.0 or Obama administration redux approach to the beginning of the Biden administration. And we're going to have some of the same challenges. You want to oppose the $1.8 trillion in spending? Oh, I'm sorry. You don't want $2,000 checks in people's hands after this pandemic? Oh, you just want giveaways for corporations. Is that right? You, you don't want uh, the money to be spent at the level it is right now because Nancy Pelosi was blocking it for obviously political reasons. Who cares? People still want their money. And if you look at the way they got Obamacare through, which also happened when they had a unified Congress and executive branch under the first, Obama, or first two years of, of Obama's uh, presidency, if you look at what happened, what do we remember about the Obamacare debate? Oh, it was big. It was unwieldy. There was all this stuff in Obamacare. But ultimately, it was you can stay in your parents' insurance until you're 26 and pre-existing conditions. That was it. There was all this other stuff. I mean, medical device taxes and exchanges and all these things. And ultimately, Obamacare just created in the individual market winners and losers chosen by the government. Some people were getting less and paying more. Other people were getting more and paying less. It was just shifting around those costs. It did not create a better, cheaper, safer, more effective healthcare system. That didn't happen. And the way that it expanded most of its coverage was actually through Medicaid, which is a healthcare welfare system, as we know, that has pretty bad long term healthcare outcomes because a lot of providers and a lot of places won't take it because of the very low reimbursement rates. And that's the only way they keep costs down. So while they say you're covered, your access to care is actually not particularly strong. This is also known as a shortage or what ends up in rationing when there are shortages. So that's all that we talked about, though, during that debate, or I should say that was what the media focus was. Guess what? Right now, they're going to say it's about $2,000 checks and a $15 minimum wage. And, and Republicans couldn't stop this even if they wanted to. So what you're going to see is, is Republicans make some noise about it, get get beat up by the Democrats verbally in talking about in in the Congress here. They're going to just smack them around, say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't want checks to Americans. And if they really try to stand fast on this one, if they if they really try to to block this massive spending package, then what happens is they're they're going to get rid of the filibuster in a way that nobody's even going to be upset about. I mean, yes, the people like me will say, oh, my gosh, this is the strategy and I see what they're doing. But what's really going to happen is that they will they will use this as an opportunity on something popular. This is this is me telling you they are setting that they know what they're doing. Forget about Biden. This is about the Democrat think tanks and activist groups and PACs and their staffs and their little wonks. They understand how to set this up. So that what looks like a, the rescue plan for America is just a, a complete open playing field for whatever else Democrats want to do, including perhaps once you get rid of the filibuster, it's going to be gone. So they're daring Republicans. Yeah, try to filibuster. And they're, by the way, Republicans don't have the backbone to do it anyway. And then you add to that the prospect. Remember, $2,000 checks, $15 minimum wage. Those are very popular issues. It is unthinkable malpractice that Mitch McConnell didn't put through 
the $2,000 checks when he could have before the Georgia Senate election. Terrible malpractice. That, that was old school GOP loser thinking. And now what? People keep asking me, what do we do? I, I want to tell you that there's a better answer as a conservative than, uh, than hide under your desk. I want to tell you that brace for impact isn't the real sentiment we should feel. But I see all these things lining up. And when you add to that the, the ability to reopen, I mean, I think Biden will figure out a way to mess this up over the long term. I think we'll see the socialist impulse, the collectivism, the ineptitude, the social justice mania, the climate change absurdity. That will all factor into this. And, and people will see, oh, my gosh, the people in charge are actually kind of nuts. What they're doing doesn't make sense. But for right now, they are, they are teeing all of this up. They are teeing all of this up. And the, the people that think that there's a plan or that there's some, and I'm just talking about from the Congress. I'm talking about from the Republican office holders, of, of whom Donald Trump will not be one in a few days. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. I speak the truth. I know. What, what should I do? Should I just tell people happy, happy fantasy stories about the GOPs? We're, we're going to have, what, a convention of the states will save us? It will not. That's not, at least, I mean, certainly not from the next uh, 12 months of what the Democrats are planning. That's not an option. So I appreciate it. I'm sure I'll get some links sent to me. What about a convention of the states? Yeah. What about the last time we did that? We didn't do that. And it's not going to happen this time either. But I, I just want everyone to see, if nothing else, they suppressed the truth about lockdowns. They, they wouldn't discuss the data during a pandemic when people were effectively being imprisoned and isolated in their own homes, separated from their fellow human beings, all the drug abuse, all the missed cancer screenings, all the overdoses, and just the depression, the actual clinical depression that has set in for so many people across the country. That wasn't enough for them to say, this is above politics. Let's have an honest conversation about these lockdowns. Uh, because this study out of Stanford, which is what Newsweek is citing here, says that you can't tell if there's the, the data doesn't show any appreciable benefit of going into extreme lockdown measures over what I've been advocating for all along, which is, you know, try to stay away from big crowds, wash your hands. If you're sick, stay away from people. But they created this this total straw man of the covid denialist. Oh, if you if you don't think that every two weeks we should add some absurd addition to the lockdown strategy. Well, now we're going to close restaurants outdoor too. Now we're going to add masks outdoor too. Or they just kept doing this, ratcheting it up. If, if you pointed out that this was absurd, it wasn't going to help anybody. What was their response? Their response was, you're a COVID denialist. You know what the data shows? The people who were saying that were wrong. And if you just think through this on your own, you recognize, of course, that stuff didn't make a difference. Because the disease wasn't really spreading outdoors in any significant way, for example. Because even with lockdowns, people are having to interact enough that the virus is still spreading. And, and initially, when we were doing this, it was all about shutting down the virus for a, a short period of time. Shutting down the spread, not entirely, of course, for a short period of time to allow us to get medical capacity. And then it transitioned into, no, we can stop this. No, we can't. If, if, you, if you pull down, you know, what, what would have been 20% of cases, let's say, or 30% of cases over a two-week period, but then you extend what you're doing over nine months, 12 months, you end up at, rough, at, at basically the same number. That's the point. It doesn't really change the eventual outcome here, which is what we're seeing all around the country. But they, they are just beginning to talk about it now because here's what I think will happen. Uh, they're going to hold out the reopen as well. They're going to leverage reopen as a means of silencing political dissent from people like me who are going to point to all the pork and all the special interest stuff and all the social justice warrior nonsense that's going to be contained in the, uh, in the uh, save us package that Biden is putting out. <laughs>
but they need about we need about 400 billion in funding from Congress to make all of what I just said happen. It's a great deal, but I'm convinced we are ready to get this done. The very health of our nation is at stake. Our rescue plan also includes immediate relief to Americans hardest hit and most in need. We will finish the job of getting a total of $2,000 in cash relief to people who need it the most. The $600 already appropriated is simply not enough. You just have to choose between paying rent and putting food on the table. For those who've kept their jobs, these checks are really important. You see, if you're an American worker making $40,000 a year with less than $400 in savings, maybe you've lost hours or maybe you're doing fewer shifts driving a truck or caring for the kids or the elderly. You're out there putting your life on the line to work during this pandemic and worried every week that you get sick, lose your job or worse. $2,000 is going to go a long way to ease that pain. $400 billion to combat the pandemic with money to accelerate the vaccine deployment. $350 billion for state and local governments that have budget shortfalls. That's right. The uh, blue cities that excessively shut down out of COVID panic and also because it was bad for the economy and bad for Trump. That was there were political calculations made here. No question. Three hundred and fifty billion dollars going to them. That that covers a lot of budget shortfalls. And what this means is that the taxpayer, you, those of you who live in redder states or places that didn't really lock down, uh, you are now subsidizing the lockdown cities. That's what's happening. So as I've been telling you all along, if you think, oh, it's not that bad in my area, so this is more of a problem for the big cities or something. Nope. If you live in North Dakota, your federal income taxes now are going to pay for firefighters and uh, and teachers unions and you name it, you know, sanitation workers in Los Angeles, Boston, New York, Washington, D.C. That's what this is. And Pelosi's gambit as grotesque and... Uh, and really just nasty, nasty as the whole thing was to hold up all this aid. I tell you the truth, and that means I'm telling you that worked. Worked. The same way that, you know, that, that Democrats complained so much about the, the gamble that the uh, Republicans took by not putting forward, uh, putting through, I should say, Merrick Garland for a vote in the Senate, and then Trump won in 2016. Nancy Pelosi held up, held up aid. The media did her bidding. It was terrible. People suffered. But now, guess what? Democrats get to be, get to be the, the great distributor of goodies to the American people. This is, this is going to be tough. This is going to be tough. I, I don't mean that part is, is tough. I mean how we actually slow down the other aspects of the Democrat agenda without looking like we're saying, no, don't give the American people aid and assistance. This is how they're doing it. They tie these things together. And increasingly what you'll see and the media will play a huge role in this, is taking the Biden agenda, the whole legislative agenda, and making it seem like it's running in parallel. It's running in parallel with the reopen. So if you oppose the Biden agenda, aren't you really just opposing the reopen? Because come on, they're getting money out there. They're getting going. We are heading into the toughest, the toughest, time for American political opposition to the the Democrat left in a decade. That's what's happening right now. The gaslighting over BLM is going to get worse and worse right now. They're going to completely change the history of that movement. And, and I remember it well because BLM was used as, and remember, there's some complexities here. There's actual BLM protests. There's Antifa taking it upon themselves to act on behalf of BLM, which they were doing constantly. Uh, and, and then there's just the looting and riots that would occur after a BLM protest, but in the name of BLM. So there's there's these different components, but overall, if we're referring to the movement of Black Lives Matter, it resulted in a lot of destruction in American cities. It resulted in dozens of deaths. And if you look at the overall homicide rates in major American cities, they've 
as a percentage, gone up dramatically. They will, just be prepared for this, the Democrats will tell you, oh, homicide is still at a, at a you know, 10-year low in the country or whatever it may be. Overall, that is true. The trajectory has been going down for a long time, which is fascinating, isn't it? Because we're always told that if only we got rid of more, if only we harass lawful gun owners more, the crime rate wouldn't be so terrible. But meanwhile, there are more and more guns in people's hands over the last 20 years. You've got over 300 million people who say, fuck, it's 500 million, but hundreds of millions of, of legal firearms in Americans' hands. And yet the crime rate had been steadily going down for the last it's really longer the last 20 years. Crime overall has been going down for decades. But this year, there is a jump up. This year, you're seeing cities like New York and Boston and Chicago and Los Angeles. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know all the numbers offhand, but you know, you're talking about 50 to 100 percent increases in shootings in some of these cities. Really bad year to year increase. And that's a result of the change in police tactics from BLM. And. I'm sorry, change in police tactics from BLM's demands that there be less aggressive policing. Uh, and that's, and, and also people not wanting to lose their jobs, their livelihoods, their pensions because they become a target of a, a BLM protest or it becomes one of these cases. You saw this in Philadelphia. I mean, there was a guy who over the summer ran at a police officer with a knife drawn, screaming, clearly deranged, and... You know, yes, the guy's mentally disturbed. It's a, it's a tragic situation, but the cop does not have an obligation to get stabbed in the face before he draws and uses his weapon. This is all on video. We all saw it. They made an issue of that case. Well, if you're a police officer and you see that, you say to yourself, well, what exactly am I supposed to do? And now when you're driving in your patrol car, you don't you see something going on down that proverbial dark alley, right? You see something happening. You know, you just keep going. Unless you get a call that you can't ignore, you're, you're just going to focus on other things. Well, that makes everybody in the community less safe. That makes everybody more subject to uh, random and, and wanton violence. But there's a big, big effort underway right now to make sure that the right is going to be treated like the exclusive, the exclusive uh, perpetrator of political violence. It's a, it's, a, it's a narrative they're trying to build right now. That's what they're doing. Uh, you have the AG for D.C., Carl uh, Racine, saying this about BLM protests. Now, I, by the way, we shouldn't be comparing BLM protests with Capitol riots. That's true. Or with the Capitol riot, I should say. We should not compare those things. We should compare the Hundreds of BLM riots with the Capitol riots or riot. See, isn't that important? Plural versus uh, versus singular. But we should compare what happened in Kenosha. We should compare what happened in Minneapolis. We should compare those incidents with Capitol Hill. And then I think that's a that's a much more apples to apples comparison. But anyway, here's what the uh, District uh, of Columbia AG has to say about a place that in regards to Black Lives Matter and the comparison to an attempt of insurrection at the Capitol, I think it speaks for itself. When people like General Mattis make clear that what this was was an attempted insurrection into our democratic ways, we know quite easily that the Black Lives Matter protest was unbelievably different. And by the way, do not let anyone, including Ken Cuccinelli or other elected officials, tell you that Democratic elected people did not condemn the violence that occurred during the summer protests. Yeah. They always did. I always did. I got to tell you, though, trying to overturn an election with violence, including violence on police officers, is something very, very different. And they should be held to account for their lies just not true that they all condemned the violence of BLM. It's just not true. We would hear, not, not only did they not condemn the violence, but they also created this special epidemiological loophole for BLM to continue to do the protest that it was doing, for BLM to engage in this, in this behavior while we are supposed to all be avoiding crowds and gatherings. Oh, it's 
It's about saving black lives, though, they told us. That was the line. Therefore, it's, it's actually protecting life to have massive crowds gather. Now, you've heard me say many times the virus doesn't really spread outdoors, according to the actual science. But I also don't think if you're gathered in a tightly packed crowd of 1,000 people screaming for hours on end, I mean, it, it might, the virus might spread a little bit there. I think that's fair to say. Walking down the street alone, no. But if you are all together in, in a very dense crowd, that may change. Anyway, they created a, a special exception for that. But the Democrats mobilize with this. The Democrats mobilized their base in the election year. As I said, they were all along. This was effective for them. The people who were telling you that everything was fine, that Trump had this under control, that there was a plan, that they were wrong. They were wrong about the preparations for the election beforehand with regard to challenging all these, the way, the way they were switching the deadlines and, and mail-in ballot procedures and all this. The Trump campaign did, did not get ahead of that issue. And I've spoken to people who were on the campaign about this. Uh, the Trump campaign didn't get ahead of that. The, uh, the messaging around BLM and Antifa was not strong enough. The president kept tweeting out law and order. It was insufficient, obviously. I mean, you have the president of the United States who's supposed to be the law and order guy, and you had riots and, and mayhem from Democrats for basically the whole summer. This was, this was not a good look, as they say. This did not work out well. But now you're going to see the... So, so look, I, I want us to understand what happened so we can do better going forward. I think that's necessary. I think that's helpful for us. But we can also look at what they're, what they're going to do now and understand their plan and rewriting the history of Black Lives Matter and making... I mean, the Capitol Hill riot, I'm seeing today, they're, they're saying that there were guys who were, wanted to break in there, and, and they, they were going to take uh, members of Congress hostage or something. And at least in one case, they're referring to somebody who ran in there with like, a, like a, a beaver pelt on his head and all painted up, who's also told authorities since he's been in custody that he thinks he's a member of an alien race. I'm being serious. I mean, this is a guy who who's clearly has, has like mental illness problems, S- serious ones. Uh, but but you and I, because we voted for Trump, we're responsible for, for this guy? Why? I have nothing to do with this person. I don't support him. I think the, I think the person needs, needs honest and serious psychiatric assistance. Um, and then there's also this... Uh, so, so there's that. You're being told, oh, there, that this was, this was the equivalent of an armed insurrection to overthrow the United States government. That's the way the media is reporting on this. When we've all seen that Yes, they're, they're somebody, they, they killed a police officer. They were in a fight that they shouldn't have been in. They caused a fight, and they attacked cops, and you shouldn't do this, and this is wrong. I don't think they intended to kill that officer with the, with the, fire, I mean, um, with the fire extinguisher, but they did, and they have to be held fully accountable. But there are also gradations here. There are levels that we have to take into account. What's the difference between a riot and the kind of insurrection that the media is talking about right now for obvious political purposes. I mean, you could have had people, and God forbid, and, and everyone should be peaceful, and I, I don't think, I don't think uh, the, any, any protests right now before the inauguration, it, it doesn't, I don't think it serves anyone's purpose for the movement. I really don't. I, I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, peaceful protests, fine, I, but I, I just would prefer personally that everything just right now, we calm down, the Biden administration's coming into power, let's let that Let's let the peaceful transfer happen, and then we can start having bigger demonstrations, peaceful, law-abiding ones about what's going on. And let's also be honest, the Democrats won't care, and the media won't cover it, and we don't have Trump anymore at the head of the movement. So, you know, this is, I don't know, I, I hope everyone appreciates, this show is like reality hour. I, I'm seeing some of what other conservatives are putting out there right now, and they're just, eh, I don't really know, and a lot of people. A lot of people got very far just, just grabbing on to the Trumpster. Oh, as long as I talk about how awesome Trump is, everybody will like me and listen to me or, or watch me or whatever. Okay, well, we can't, that, that doesn't work anymore. That's not going to happen. Now, I think Trump is going to continue to have a voice once he leaves office and will play a role in the movement. How big a role, I don't know. But we got to tend to what's going on, what's going on right now. Um, oh, I was talking about the layers of 
of analysis here we'd have to apply to the Capitol Hill, what they're calling the insurrection. Insurrection in other countries would involve sending people with you know, automatic weapons to overtake with force and to hold and to say we're in charge now and we're the government now. That's, that's really what an insurrection is. So that's, that's completely to think that what happened at Capitol Hill rises to that level, which is how they're treating it. That's, that's just not honest analysis of the situation. There, there was no reality. There was no future in which they were going to hold the Capitol and hold the government. A lot of the people in there were just running around like idiots taking selfies. And, you know, they thought that this was some kind of a. I, I, I don't I don't even know, I, honestly, what they were thinking is, is a little bit uh, beyond me. Not the people outside. Who are holding up placards and protesting and saying that they're concerned and they feel the election was stolen. And then I totally get where they're coming from. But running around inside the Capitol. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, and it's, it's a lot worse than it doesn't make sense to me, but you know what I'm saying. I, I, can't even, I can't even put my mind in a place where I could see how that decision would be made. But then there's also the first person that we've seen here who is an agent uh, provocateur, uh, somebody who is clearly a BLM left-wing activist who was encouraging people inside the Capitol uh, to engage in this kind of behavior. He's basically saying, yeah, this is great. Let's go riot. You know, he's been on CNN before, too. There's federal charges now filed against the guy. So he, he was, there were leftists. There were leftists throwing gasoline on the fire. There were a lot of, a lot of MAGA people, though. A lot of Trump supporters. That's also true. But the, we have at least one leftist now that the Department of Justice has said was in there exacerbating things and making things worse. And they're, they're bringing serious, serious charges against him. My office was tasked with the responsibility of launching a civil investigation into the New York City Police Department's response to these protests. What we found was an egregious abuse of police power rampant excessive use of force and leadership unable and unwilling to stop it there you have the attorney general for new york leticia james who has said that she's going to use her she's been open about it use her uh, prosecutorial powers to go after trump and not just while he's in office get ready for that she's uh calling out the nypd that's that's the problem. You see, this, this is very deeply ingrained in the Democrat left mindset that the issue with with violence in cities and the, and the and the problem with these protests that turned into riots. Is a cop. The real problem is the cop. This is going to be commonplace. You're going to hear this uh, all the way from the very top. They'll always say this. They'll do this, this, this throat clearing about, you know, or oh, we, we respect our, you know, Joe Biden will say, oh, we respect our law enforcement officers, comma. But there's so much racism with cops and cops are so racist and they're bad and we need to stop them from being such racist. Well, if, if cops are so bad and so racist, how are you? Re- well, why, why would you respect them, Joe Biden? Why would you think that they deserve? the benefit of the doubt for doing what's a very difficult and even dangerous job. But uh, this, is, this is just, that's just to cover themselves so that some people go, well, I guess the, the Democrats don't really, they're not really willing to, and look, when I say they hate the cops, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, Chuck Schumer, they're all going to call them, first of all, they've all got security details, start with that. They've all, they've all got personal police. But even beyond that, yeah, of course, they'd call the cops the moment that somebody you know, somebody's baseball fell in Nancy's uh, petunias in her backyard of her mansion in San Francisco. They don't hate cops as in they don't want to use the cops, but they will pretend they will placate that sentiment that the police are the real problem. And and this is why you've got Leticia James, the attorney general for New York State, saying, oh, yeah, the, the issue here is that the NYPD, they were really out of line. They were really doing bad stuff. Uh, that's interesting because I remember when I was uh, talking to people who work in my building. I live in a, a tall apartment building in New York City, and there's a staff that works in the building, and there was some at the front desk, and uh, they were worried 
about what would happen if somebody came in and smashed up the smashed up the lobby. It's all glass, smashed up the lobby and started smash. You know, what do they do? This was on the purge night when they were smashing windows across the street. So this isn't some some irrational fear to have when there's mobs of people running through the streets freely and breaking stores and breaking store windows and stealing stuff, including on Fifth Avenue in one of the most visible and uh, and high end shopping districts in the whole world. It, it's understandable why you'd be concerned. Who's going to come and help me if this mob decides that they want to start going after private homes? Who's going to who's going to help me if the mob decides that they they don't like the look on my face and they're going to this is. Oh, but the cops were the problem that night. Right. The cops were the problem for the riots that kept happening and happening and happening. Dem- did Democrats ever call for it to stop? Do you remember that? Do you remember a single prominent Democrat coming forward and saying you're really the BLM movement's really about police reform and and making this a better country so we have to absolutely stop all acts of destruction and, and criminal behavior. Do you remember that speech? Well, I know you don't because it didn't happen. There was no Democrat who was making that point. 